Okay, uh, First Peter, uh, written by the Apostle Peter, probably from Rome around A.D. 62-63. His intended audience is mainly Gentile Christians in Asia Minor, Christians that he apparently had not personally evangelized. Uh, that just I think that's from chapter one, verse 12. It looks like these are these are people that he, that weren't people that churches that he had planted. Now, the Christians to whom he's writing they're they're undergoing a kind of, of persecution, some kind of suffering and hardship. Now, most people think it's a local, unofficial persecution, the kind of thing that was going on throughout the Roman Empire uh, because of just general hostility to Christians, that they didn't quite fit in with uh, all that the. You know, the Roman citizenry expected. So they're undergoing that kind of, of persecution. They're probably being criticized and mocked and discriminated against and maybe uh, dragged into court on trumped up charges, all of which, uh, as I say, begins to sound a little bit familiar to resonate with what I see going on today, or at least on the horizon. And Peter's writing to encourage them to endure in their faith, in the face of these difficulties. In other words, when, when all is well for Christians, when it's, when it's easy for, uh, to, to be a Christian, when there is no suffering and difficulty, there's no pressure, there's no price to be paid, it's easy to, to be, you know, hang on. But when you're, when you're getting, uh, persecuted for your faith, uh, there is a temptation to pull back and to withdraw and say, I'm going to abandon the faith. It's just not worth it. And so he writes to them, as you see many of the letters, uh, I'm thinking of Hebrews and there are others, where he, he writes and he says, listen, you need to hold on. You need to endure. You need to double down in the face of persecution and hardship because you're being pressured to let go and don't do it. And so he's writing to, to inspire them, to encourage him. He greets them in the first two verses of chapter one. And then in verses three through nine, he speaks to them. Of the blessings of salvation. You can see how that's relevant to encouraging somebody to hold fast in the face of persecution. You need to see the salvation that is yours in Jesus Christ. And he tells them that God is to be praised for giving them new birth into a living hope through Christ's atoning work. And then he spells out for them the substance of that hope. He says that it's, it's an inheritance that is eternal, precious and constant which they will receive when Christ returns to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated at his first coming. And their reaction on that day is going to be one of unparalleled rejoicing. And I say that a lot, and I I just I love the picture on that day of the partying, the rejoicing, the celebration, as we in that state are sitting here and just saying, do you remember sitting here talking? I I just it's just to me a tremendous vision. And so he tells them that there's going to be unparalleled rejoicing. And he explains that the various trials they were suffering, they were a testing of their faith. See, like gold is tested so that as that faith is shown genuine through these trials, that you don't say, OK, well, that's I quit. No, you're right. No, 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 no. You're right. This, this Christ thing, I don't want to take that too far. I quit. But as your faith is shown to be genuine through those difficulties and pressures, that that's genuineness of your faith will result in their praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ. See, on that day, that there will be, well, well done, good and faithful servant. I know that you faced a lot of pressures. I know that you had these pushes on you to forego your confession and your faith in me, but you didn't. Well done. And so he tells them that. Then in chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, he says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace to come to you diligently searched and carefully inquired, inquiring into what time or what sort of time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when predicting the sufferings coming to Christ and the glories after these things. It was revealed to them that they were presenting these things not for themselves, but for you, which things have now been announced to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, into which things angels long to look. Now, we were looking at this section when we ended last week. And as I said last week, Peter highlights the greatness of the salvation. He's he's told them about the greatness of their salvation. Now he's going to emphasize it. He's going to highlight it for them because he wants them to understand, have a clear view of what it is I'm talking about. 
You see, as you're getting pushed and pulled to forego Christ, to drop your allegiance to him, understand what he has provided for you. Understand that. He wants them to do that. And he highlights the greatness of their salvation. He does that by noting that the Old Testament prophets who through the Spirit foretold the coming of this salvation, that they, they, had, they were so taken by the glory of this salvation that they expended themselves. They expended themselves trying to discern the time or the general period when the means and grounds of that salvation, that is the sufferings of Christ and subsequent exaltation, which they were presenting, they were predicting. They expended themselves trying to determine when those things would occur. Is that marvelous? That's significant. That they're predicting these things and they're so interested they want to know. What is the time or the era or the sort of time when these marvelous things that we are predicting, when is it going to occur? Now, these prophets, they probably sought to discern when these predictions would be fulfilled. They sought that, but presumably they did it by uh, investigating their times and circumstances, the times and circumstances of their own lifetimes. You know, you're looking around saying, "Okay, do we see this happening now? They probably look back on earlier prophecies and tried to get an insight into that. And or they they sought further revelation or wisdom from God. So when he says there that they're they're expending themselves and in, in trying to determine this, this is how I think they're trying to determine when this is going to occur. And the seeking wisdom and further revelation, you can see, for example, in Daniel 12, 8, you see that idea of wanting further uh, information and wisdom from God. Now, they no doubt they were hoping that this great work of God about which they prophesied that it would be fulfilled in their days because it was so great, so glorious. They no doubt were hoping that. But it was revealed to them that the prophecies were at least primarily for those in Peter's audience or those like Peter's audience. You see, those who lived on the other side of the Christ event. See, there's there's looking at you know, is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? Our day? But it was revealed to them, though, that primarily these things are for those who live on the other side of the Christ event. Those who had the glorious news of the crucifixion and exaltation announced to them through the spirit inspired and spirit empowered preaching of the gospel. See, so that these guys, it was revealed to them that primarily this is going to be for those on the other side of this event. I'm sure there was some. Benefit to them in knowing this is coming, but primarily it's going to be for those on the other side, like like Peter's audience. Peter's writing to them. And if you see that these Old Testament prophets has revealed to them that the primary beneficiaries of what we're revealing here are going to be you. You're going to live in the time after he comes in history. And so, he, you know, I I hope he, he wants the people to see this is amazing. This is absolutely, it's no ho-hum, it's no like, oh, you know, who cares? You know, that Christianity, redemption, all of these words, what do they mean? You see, and we are so immersed in it, it's easy to lose the sense of its magnificence. And, I, you know, he's writing to them, so he wants them to understand that. Now, God's redemption of sinful humanity through the atoning work of Christ An event having now occurred in history is a subject so sublime, so awe-inspiring that angels long to look into it. They long to explore its depths. Now, that ought to tell us something. Right? Angels are tuned into this. And so how can we yawn at it? You know, they're interested in it. They want to plumb its depths. Thomas Schreiner, in his commentary, he says... The privilege of enjoying and anticipating salvation comes to the forefront. Old Testament prophets saw it from afar. And angels also marvel when gazing upon what God has done in Christ, while the Petrine readers actually experience it. So he writes to them, getting the hammer, getting pressured, and he says, get a grip of this. See the magnificence of what is yours in Jesus Christ. And then he tells them in chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, he says, Therefore, having bound up the loins of your mind, that's an odd phrase, but roll up the sleeves of your mind. Okay, prepare. Having bound up the loins of your mind, being sober, 
set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the former passions when in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. See, given the greatness of the salvation in which they participate, the salvation that he has just described to them, that he has highlighted and reinforced by the fact the Old Testament prophets talked about it, the angels long to look into it. Given the greatness of that salvation, they need actively, affirmatively, to set their hope fully on the gracious blessings to be given them at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Set their hopes fully on that. You see, and this involves preparing their minds to do that. And that involves having a sober grasp of their salvation, a clear understanding of what that salvation entails. It involves appreciating the certainty and the magnificence of that salvation. See, when one grasps, when one gets a hold of what is in store for the faithful in Christ, one is strengthened to live in light of that expectation. You see, when you get a, get a firm grip on what is in store for the faithful in Christ, you are strengthened to live in the here and now based on that expectation. One is prepared to have one's present life shaped by that hope. I've told you before, you know, that show that there was a television show that lasted about a season that got canceled. It was based on a movie, uh, Terminator. And I, I got a kick out of it. And the thing was, is that they had come back, you know, they knew the future. They knew what the, you know, the war of the machines and this great thing was going to. So here they are back in this time, knowing what the future holds. And they're living their lives completely for this future war. Why? They knew what the future held. It changed. Everybody else thinks they're crazy. But they know the future and they're living that way. It impacts how they live. Their life was devoted based on how their knowledge of the future had transformed their present life. And see, this is what he's saying to them. You need to affirmatively set your mind, set your hope fully on this. And see, this involves the idea of of your expectation of the future feeding back into how you live in the here and now. Setting one's hope fully on the blessings of the eschaton, of the end time, isn't simply expecting those things. See, it's not like I set my hope fully because I now really, really expect them. It's not simply that. It includes choosing to live in light of those blessings. Choosing to live a life pleasing to the provider of those blessings. That's what it means to set your hope fully. It's not simply fully expecting it. It is allowing that expectation to transform how I live now. That's the measure of my expectation. Will I live now in light of that hope? Will it change how I live now? And therefore, he winds up in in, in verses 14 to 16. He then calls them what? To holy lives. Holy lives. That's how they are to live. Because the God who called them to this salvation, because he is holy, Christians are to be holy in all their conduct. You see, there is no area of life that is exempt. Christians are to be holy in all their conduct. Now, when you apply holiness to God, Okay, holiness applied to God is a very large subject. It involves his total distinctiveness, his total set apartness, his total otherness. So it's like a summary of God. But there is an emphasis when you speak of the holiness of God, there is an emphasis on his moral and ethical distinctiveness. He is set apart in many ways, but he is set apart in that he is perfectly and infinitely good and righteous and just and faithful and kind and loving and forgiving and on and on. He is absolutely morally and ethically perfect. Atomic white. Not a spot, speck, anything. 
So the emphasis you see on his holiness, it is a broad subject, encompasses many things, but the emphasis is on his moral and ethical distinctiveness. That stress, it's seen in, in the contrasting of his holiness to sin. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, after referring to God in chapter 1, verse 12 as the Holy One, Habakkuk says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Isaiah 5, 16 says, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will show himself holy by his righteousness. So holiness is larger than that. But there is a stress on his moral and ethical distinctiveness. Now, when you talk about Christians, Christians are holy. Okay, we are holy in one sense. We are holy in the sense that God has set us apart, that he has made us special through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are uniquely related to him through the holy cleansing that we've received through the blood of Jesus Christ, right? We are his special people. We are set apart. Objects for his work. We are participants in the revolution. So there is a sense in which we are holy. You can see that in Hebrews many places, but Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 10, especially in verse 10. In fact, the word saints... It literally is what? It's literally holy ones. Okay, so there's a sense in which Christians, we are holy. We've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, set apart, special to God. There is a sense in which we are holy, but we are called here to be holy. You see, we are holy, we're set apart, but we are called to be holy in conduct. We are called to live a life that matches the holiness that God has given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are to be morally and ethically distinct because the God who called us to salvation is morally and ethically distinct. We are to live differently from the world. Now, we have to see that. We have to understand that. As I've said, you know, ad nauseum, it's, this isn't the Rotary Club. This is a holy group of people, and we owe it to one another to call one another to holiness without apology. I'm not talking about being a mean, snobby person who says, great, I can just jump on somebody. But it is to call one another to righteous living. No, no apology for that. Right? I mean, we wear the name Christ. We are called to be holy. You're my brother and sister. You wear the name Christ. I call you to holiness. You call me to holiness. Without saying, oh, well, you know, I really shouldn't do that. That seems judgmental to me. Uh, uh, No, we have to because we are called to be holy in every aspect of conduct. See, we're to be morally and ethically distinct from the world. You can see this aspect of holiness in many places. Romans 6, 19, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 7. So you have this idea given the glory of this salvation that they have, which he tells them to strengthen them from their, you know, because the temptation is to say, listen, I'm getting hammered by the world. If I am less distinct from the world, maybe the world will give me a pass. If I start to blend in with the world, if I start to be more like the world, if I start to talk like the world, act like the world, live like the world, then maybe the world will say, you know, he's okay. You see, he's, so you see the temptation that comes. So these things are tied together. He says, listen, you have a salvation that is a mind blower. That's my word. You have a salvation that is a mind blower. He says, in light of that, what God has given to you, you have to live holy lives. Be holy in all your conduct. Be holy in all your conduct. Then he says, and since in verses chapter 1, verse 17 to 21, And since you call upon a father who judges impartially according to each person's work, live in fear during the time of your sojourn, knowing that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood as of an unblemished and spotless lamb, the blood of Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the last of the times for your sake who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave glory to him so that your faith and hope 
might be in God. Now, given the fact, see, that the, the, the heavenly father they call upon is one who judges impartially according to each person's work and thus one who will not wink at rebellion or defiance from anyone. He judges impartially each person's work, so he's not going to sit here and say, OK, you come on in, you go ahead and you can rebel and you can defy me and all that stuff. And I'll just sit here and say, that's OK, that's fine for you. Okay, he will not wink at rebellion or defiance from anyone. So given that, they need to live in fear of the consequences of defying God. Now, this strikes us, you know, we don't like talking about that. You talk about fear, you know, you you know, no, that's that can't be good. Uh, It's the fear of the consequences of disobeying God. In other words, they cannot presume upon their relationship with God And imagine that it frees them to disrespect or mock God by the way they live. You can't say, well, God and I are tight. So I just go ahead and I'll just treat him like he's into nothing. You know, we're like this. He doesn't care. I can get away with anything. I'll live any way I want to. Why? We're tight. You see, you cannot presume on that relationship. That is to dishonor God, to disrespect God, to mock God. And that's what Peter's getting at. He's telling him, listen, you have to live. Karen Jobes in her commentary says the pagan life that God abhors will be no less abhorred if it is lived by one who professes to be a Christian. So we have to hear this. Do you think that because you've been baptized into Christ, that then frees you to live like a pagan in rebellion to him? Do you turn him into? Sin cleanser in the sky where his his call on your life means nothing. But I just live the way I want to. And that night I say, forgive me. And life is great. Do you think that's how God is? That's not how he is. He calls and says, I called you for your life. You gave me your life. You committed your life to me. Now, don't treat me like that. Don't think you can abuse me and treat me that way. Okay, we have to see that. We have to understand. Thomas Schreiner, in his commentary, says, There is a kind of fear that does not contradict confidence. A confident driver also possesses a healthy fear of an accident that prevents him from doing anything foolish. A genuine fear of judgment hinders believers from giving in to libertinism. The background of such fear can be traced to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4, 10 and 8, 6. And the wisdom tradition, Proverbs 1, 29, 3, 7, 9, 10, Job 28, 28, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, where the fear of the Lord informs all of life. You see, this is this is something that is important to grasp. We are not to fear men. When they seek to bully us from faithfulness to God, right? Men, of course, includes women. We're not to fear any human being who comes and tries to push us off the faith as what was happening to them and what happens to us. We all face pressures in the world trying to get you to sell on Christ. That's all. It's a spiritual war. All of these things, see, they're working that way and they're coming after your faith saying, listen, I want you to surrender this guy. I want you to worship someone other than him. I want you to yield I want you to turn it loose. So we're not to give in to that, right? I mean, you see that in Matthew 10, 28, Acts 5, 29, Hebrews 13, 6. We'll see it later in Peter and other places. We do not, as believers, wind up saying, okay, well, I think I'm afraid this guy may, he may not like me or he may do something to me. I, okay, I quit. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going to, it was going to involve any price. That is not how we're to be. We are not to fear human beings, but we must fear God. You see, we absolutely must fear God. That's all over the Bible. Psalm 111.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And when Paul says of people in Romans 3.18 that there's no fear of God before their eyes, that's not a compliment. He's not saying when he says there's no fear of God before their eyes, he's saying these people are a law to themselves. They live the way they want. They don't care what God wants. Well, that's not healthy. There is to be a fear of the Lord. In fact, in in 1 Peter 2.17, he's going to just flatly command them, fear God. Okay, so we we can't 
get around that and say, listen, I don't want to I don't want to have that as a part of of biblical teaching or Christian faith. We are commanded to do it. We must have this respect and reverence for God so that we fear the consequences of defying him. Not that we sit here and shudder and say every second he's looking to kill me, to beat me. He's mean. We don't, not that. He's your loving father. He holds you close. But you know, if I want to go and mock him and defy him, ooh, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Right? It's not like that, you know, that commercial, that little cartoon I've mentioned many times from the New Yorker where you got that guy sitting here, he's straightening his tie and the, the line is, prepare to meet thy God. And he's kind of, no, it's not going to be like that. You see, you see when, when angels appear, or when you know, people appear, when the Lord Jesus appears, and what does John do? He falls down as though dead. He's not even going to twitch, breathe, move. Just completely still. There's not going to be any of this arrogance that we, you know, sell to ourselves. I hear people mocking God all the time. Just talking about God, you know, like, yeah, oh. It's just not going to be like that. Okay, it's not going to be that way. And the motivation, so, so there has to be, and there's no apology for it. There has to be in the Christian a fear of the Lord, a fear of God. It is not, like I say, it is not this idea of I'm just paranoid and think he hates me. It is that I fear the consequences of rebelling against him. Just like this driver in this example, he fears what happens in an accident. Doesn't mean he's not confident in what he's doing right now, the motivation toward holy living that's provided by a sober awareness of the dreadful consequences of defying God is reinforced or multiplied. It's reinforced or multiplied by an awareness of the breathtaking price that was paid for their redemption. Right. He says, uh, let me get back here. He says, and since you call upon a father who judges impartially according to each person's works, live in fear during the time of your sojourn, knowing That you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood as as of an unblemished and spotless lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ. They are to live knowing that their deliverance from the empty way of life they had inherited as Gentiles, a way of life that was degrading to them and had no hope of eternal life. It was empty that way. But see, we, we have here this, the motivation, you know, they are, they are to live not just in the fear of the Lord, but they're to live knowing that this deliverance that they've received from this empty way of life, they are to live knowing that that was purchased with something more precious than all the wealth in this decaying cosmos. It was purchased with the supremely precious blood, meaning the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, wrap your mind around that, that this salvation, this redemption that is yours in Christ was purchased at such a tremendous price. See, his blood was analogous to that of an unblemished and spotless lamb that was offered in sacrifice under the old covenant in that it was poured out for the benefit of others. That's what he did. He died for us. He died for lost humanity. So you sit there and say, well, part of my motivation is holy living. I'm aware of the dreadful consequences of rebelling against God, of treating God with disrespect. But that's multiplied by an awareness of the price that was paid for that salvation. We have to see that, not to lose it. You see, and when we hear it and we hear it, we just get numb to it. And we have to work to keep it fresh and alive and understand That we are where we are because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, and so this is this is an important thing, and he wants them to understand that. Now, the incarnation of God, the son, the second member of the Godhead, his incarnation as the God man, Jesus Christ, and his accomplishment of redemption for mankind through his atoning death and resurrection. This was, of course, known by God from eternity. This was known by God from eternity, but it was revealed in the last times, in the last days, in the sense that Christ inaugurated 
the kingdom of God. He ushered in the new age that marks the end of the old age in principle. It marks the end of the old age in principle and the beginning of its end in fact. Now, I have talked about this a lot. I'm going to say a little bit about it. But if you go to the notes on the uh, uh, the parables of Jesus, I have a lot more on this. I'm going to repeat one of the quotes I gave you there, and I've got another one here. But here is how. Let me give you two uh, New Testament scholars. The first diagram is from David Wenham, who was a, he was a lecturer in New Testament at Oxford University for many years. And the bottom one is from uh, James D.G. Dunn, who was an internationally respected New Testament scholar. He's at the University of Durham in England. But this is what they're depicting here. It's a representation of Jewish thinking about the coming and the nature of the kingdom of God. See, their thinking was that you had the old age, you had a decisive intervention, and then you had the new age. A one-shot, decisive intervention, old age, boom, new age. You see, done, older age, end point, age to come. But that's not New Testament theology. You see, the New Testament corrects this view and gives a different image and a different teaching in that the kingdom of God, the age to come, was ushered in or inaugurated in the Christ event, but that the consummation awaits his return. Let me read to you a couple of people. This is uh, uh, Preben Vang and Terry Carter in their book, Telling God's Story, the Biblical Narrative from Beginning to End, uh, published in 2006. They say, according to Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here, right? We understand that the kingdom of God is a present reality. The point is, is that it's not the sole reality yet. It has come. It has invaded. We are participants in the kingdom, but it awaits a consummation when all that is contrary to the eternal purposes of God will be stripped out. And then the kingdom of God will be the sole reality for eternity. You see, this is the idea. He says, according to Jesus, the kingdom of God is already here. Jesus inaugurated it. The age to come has broken into the present age. God is making his presence felt already now. Yet the kingdom of God is not here in full in the sense that there is a, it remains to be consummated when there will be the end of death and mourning and crying and suffering and all of that. Those are things of the old age and the old order. But in the new age, the new order, the divine utopia, that's going to be gone when it's consummated, but it's already broken in now. You see, he says, evil, he says, yet the kingdom of God is not here in full. Evil still exists. God does not yet fill all in all. First Corinthians 15, 28. This will only happen at the time of consummation when Christ comes back. We now live between the times from his coming, his initial coming, Christ's first coming. He inaugurates the kingdom. And he's second coming, he consummates the kingdom, and we live in between those times when the old age still continues and overlaps with the inauguration of the kingdom of God, the inbreaking of the new age. Okay, he says the promised age to come has already begun, but is not here in full. The old age is still here as well. Let me read to you another uh, a quote, this one is from Michael Byrd. I haven't given you this one before. Michael Byrd, I mentioned last week, is an up-and-coming New Testament scholar. This is from his book, Introducing Paul. And Byrd says, fundamental to Paul's theology is that the future age, the eschaton, has already broken in and has been inaugurated through the life, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. The coming of Jesus has inaugurated a new era of redemptive history, and God's new age has been launched upon the world. Something like a covert operation seizing key nodes along the rear echelons of an opposing force. Those people who confess faith in the Messiah and experience the transforming power of the Spirit of God are living billboards in our global metropolis advertising God's activity in the world and pointing to things soon to come. At the same time, the old age continues Death and evil are realities that need to be confronted and endured, but their power has been broken in principle and even in practice. What is more, the day is coming when God will finally do away with them and the old age will be no more. On that day, God will be all in all. There was a scholar from another generation named Coleman, who his example, what he used was the idea of D-Day in World War II. Where he said that after D-Day, victory was a fait accompli. But after after D-Day, victory was a fait accompli. It was just, you know, you're just waiting for it. 
It's like the guy's already jumped off the cliff. He's just waiting for him to hit. And so he used that, that idea. Let me give you a diagram here. Here's Dunn. Now, here's Dunn's view of the Jewish view in the first century, the, the, the way the Jews saw the nature and coming of the kingdom that I already showed you. And then here is his representation of the New Testament view. Do you see how the end point has been, he would say, pulled apart? The age to come has come into the now. You see, with the cross, the resurrection, the Christ event. But the present age continues until the second coming, the end point. And I just think it's an important perspective. In fact, many years ago, well, I don't know how many now, five years ago, something like that. I was at the meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society. And I think Brian Vickers was speaking. And he said that New Testament scholars were, uh, they were waiting for the second coming so they could finally stop saying the now and the not yet. In other words, it's that, it's, it's that entrenched, that understood. Let me show you how, this is how Wenham, this is a, this might blind you. I had to draw this one or type it or whatever. This is how David Wenham depicts the idea. You see, in his, uh, in his book, The Parables of Jesus, here's Wenham's depiction of this idea. Okay, same thing that Dunn was showing, just diagram differently. You see the old age of Satan, that that carries on. Then we have the kingdom of God that is broken in, and you have this, we live in this overlap. That's where our life is. The kingdom of God is a present reality, but look around. Look at the sin and the suffering and all that. At the consummation, as you see in Revelation 21 other places, that's gone. You see? And so this is important. I want you to see this. And Christ ushers in. Here's what Thomas Schreiner in his commentary says specifically about the first Peter chapter one, verse 20. Schreiner says the end of the ages signals the last days of salvation history, which commenced with the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like in Hebrews one, two, in these last days and other places. You see, it commenced with the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Michaels, that's J. Ramsey Michaels in his commentary, rightly notes that the phrase here is to be distinguished from in the last time in verse five. The latter refers to the eschatological inheritance that awaits believers. The judgment day, the consummation. You see, he says, but the phrase here indicates that the last times have commenced with the coming of Christ. And as Schreiner adds in a footnote, what we have here is inaugurated, but not yet consummated eschatology. The stunning privilege of believers is communicated once again because all these things occurred for your sake. What a tragedy it would be to throw all these, throw away all these privileges, throw all these privileges away by ceasing to live in the fear of God. Okay, by ceasing to live in the fear of God. Five minutes. We're still going. Now, you see here in the last the last line here, verse 21, it's through Christ that these Gentiles, they have become believers in God, the father. The gospel of Christ is God's saving work on their behalf. So in embracing the gospel, they put their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In embracing the gospel, they are trusting in God the Father. It was God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead, who exalted him to the greatest heights, intending that people would put their faith and hope in him and as, as a result of the redemption that he provided in Christ. He provides this, and he intends that people put their hope and their trust in him through that. And that is what these Gentiles had done. They had been brought to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had been grafted in to the whole stream of history that is Israel. Right? You know, the whole you, you have Israel and then you have true Israel, those people who really believe God, what he said about Jesus. And then you have Gentiles who are the wild shoots who through their faith are grafted in so they are spiritual Israel. You see, we are sons of Abraham, as you'll see in a little bit, daughters, sons and daughters of Sarah. But here he says, see, this is what he wants. And he says in 122 to 25, I'll just introduce this and we'll pick up next week. He says, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, resulting in genuine brotherly love, love one another fervently from a pure heart, having been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached as good news to you. 
This is the word that was preached. See, they had they had purified themselves. They had done that by obedience to the truth, meaning they had accepted the gospel. They had become Christians, which includes their submission to baptism. Okay, this isn't a secret. You're going to see Peter say that expressly about the link between salvation and baptism in chapter 3, verse 21. But as I've, I've said before, everybody understood the role of baptism until the Reformation was Zwingli. Now, the Catholics had a different idea. They said, well, we can do it with children to get rid of original sin. But everybody reading the Bible for 1,500 years recognized that baptism was the moment when faith called out to God in his way. You see, everybody understood that until Zwingli comes along and says, no, this is all crazy. You know, Martin Luther, I've, I've said before, Martin Luther, people, they were criticizing Luther. They said that that was a, you know, they're like, you know, you're having work salvation because Luther continued to believe in the necessity of baptism. He said, well, it is a work. He said, but it's a work of God. You see, anyway, we'll talk more about that when we get down to that. But here's this idea. See, baptism. Let me read you Peter David's and I think we'll be through. David's in his commentary in the New International Commentary on the New Testament. He says, the image of purification is that of Old Testament washings that made one ready to participate in the cult, in the religious activity there. And he cites a number of texts. This figure was taken over in the New Testament and stood for both inward purification through repentance from sin, James 4, 8, 1 John 3, 3, and Christian initiation, which included repentance, commitment to Christ, and baptism as here. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. This guy's not in the Church of Christ. <laughs> okay? So we get this idea sometimes that, no, it's just, it's just people in Churches of Christ who understand what happens in baptism. No. You see, that's an idea that I think we've gotten through some kind of, uh, I don't know, we've got some kind of uh, complex about that. This is clear, understood, and I've done lessons before where I've gone through through history and all these people. Anyway, thanks for coming. We'll pick up next week, Lord willing.